Hey folks, so today what I want to do is to talk a little bit about philosophy, in particular what's known as epistemology or the theory of knowledge in early Buddhism. So when the first uh, recorded texts began, of course all of this would have gone uh, back well before these texts even existed, texts such as uh, the Vedas in India, or the Iliad and the Odyssey in Greece, or the Bible. When these texts began, there was really no, no uh, idea, no theory of how we knew what we claimed to know, or how the, uh, the people who produced these texts knew what they claimed to know. However, in time, what happened in all of these different cultures, in particular uh, the culture of ancient Greece, the culture of ancient India, is a number of different schools of thought began to arise at the same time. It wasn't only the Vedas in India, but it was also the new Upanishadic thinkers. It was also uh, the Jains. It was also other schools of thought at the time, all competing uh, to give people knowledge or apparent knowledge of the way the world was, of how we should uh, live our lives, of how we should act. And people were confused for obvious reasons. There's all these different uh, theories out there. Which one is true? How do they know what to believe? How do people who claim to have knowledge, how do they justify that claimed knowledge? And so this is when we began to have the appearance of the first theories of knowledge, the first attempts to rigorously understand how we knew what we claimed to know. And there's one a really good a book about this when it comes to early Buddhism, which is Kayan Jayatilik's uh, Early Buddhist Theory of Knowledge. I have a copy of it here, and I will leave a link to, uh, to it down below in the notes if you want to, to read it. It's a very dense book. Uh, it takes uh, quite a bit of effort to go through, so I wouldn't recommend it for light reading, uh, but it is the best of its kind. Now, Jayatilik uh, studied with Wittgenstein in Europe. He was uh, very close to the logical positivists in the mid-20th century, so you have to take his views uh, with that understood, that his views come from a particular point of view. Nevertheless, it's a very serious historical work, and one that I think uh, that I would recommend that you take a look at. Uh, in Jayatilik's understanding uh, of the early Buddhist theory of knowledge, we can really look, I think, uh, most specifically at one text in early Buddhism to give us the, the broad overview of that theory of knowledge. And this is a very famous a text, or at least a, a text that's famous nowadays. We call it the, the text to the Kalamas, or the, uh, the Sutta to the Kalamas. And this is a text that the, uh, the Buddha undertook. He went to a, a region of India, uh, where he, he uh, gave a talk to a number of people known as the Kalamas, and these were people who were, in general, uh, confused. They were in the same situation I just uh, recently discussed, which is that there were a number of holy people, a number of people with claims about knowledge who came through their town, all of them disagreeing with one another. And so they didn't know what to believe. And so they asked the Buddha, what should we believe and why? Which of these is true? And so the Buddha gave them a talk. In that talk, he distinguished between what are uh, bad or improper sources of knowledge and what are good or proper sources of knowledge. And that is really where we can begin, and, and certainly I, I would say where, in, in a nutshell, uh, uh, Jayatilik begins in his understanding of the early Buddhist theory of knowledge. So what I want to do is to, is to go through a particular quote. This is really the heart, the meat of the matter when it comes to uh, early Buddhism, and then we'll go through the, the bad sources and the good sources in that order. So here is what the Buddha said. He said, Please, Kalamas, don't go by oral transmission, don't go by lineage, don't go by testament, don't go by canonical authority, don't rely on logic, don't rely on inference, don't go by reasoned contemplation, don't go by the acceptance of a view after consideration, don't go by the appearance of competence, and don't think the ascetic is our respected teacher or our guru. But when you know for yourselves 
These things are skillful, blameless, praised by sensible people, and when you undertake them they lead to welfare and happiness, then you should acquire them and keep them. And of course when things are unskillful, blameworthy, and uh, condemned by a sensible people, then you should not. That, that goes without saying, that's the next section of this particular point. But in any event, in this uh, quote, the Buddha goes through a couple, uh, I should say, a number of different kinds of illegitimate knowledge or, or, or wrong kinds of ways to approach knowledge. And those come under two different headings. We might term them authority on the one hand and reason on the other. So when it comes to authority, there are such things as oral transmission, lineage, testament, canonical authority, and because someone is your, you know, believing something is true because just because somebody is your teacher or your guru. And with reason uh, goes under logic, inference, reasoned contemplation, consideration, or the apparent competence of the speaker. Now to be clear, and I'll, I'll repeat this a number of times, it wasn't that these uh, claimed sources of knowledge were always false. Uh, we, we can't sort of uh, uh, assume that if something falls under one of these headings that we shouldn't, therefore should not believe it. It's simply that these are uh, not uh, guaranteed to provide, provide knowledge. Uh, we can, these things can be true and nevertheless the thing that we're being told is false. And I'll go through some of that. First, let's deal with authority. This involves things such as oral transmission, that the information you're given has been, is, is traditionally believed, it's been passed down from teacher to student over a long period of time, and the Buddha in other texts talks about the problem here being the potential for, the, for what he terms the blind leading the blind. This is a, a metaphor that exists in a lot of different traditions, but in any event in Buddhism it, it exists as well. This idea that perhaps the person who's telling you this is blind, and the person who told him that was similarly blind. So that they're just one blind person leading the other, none of them really knows. We find this uh, mentioned quite a bit in what's known as the Chanqi Sutta, which is a sutta that I discussed in a couple of uh, past videos of mine. I'll, I'll, I'll leave links to those videos down below in the notes as well if you want to hear more about this issue. But in the Chanqi Sutta, the Buddha is having an argument or a discussion with a young Brahmin who is accepting the authority of the Vedas on very similar reasons. That is to say, he's accepting the, the authority of the Vedas based on tradition, based on uh, the, what, what has been passed down from, from teacher to student over a period of years, and or period of centuries, really. And the, the Buddha's point here is that that could be true, and nevertheless, the information this young Brahmin is espousing is nonetheless not knowledge. He doesn't know it. It's not necessarily true. An example of that, uh, the, the potential for that not being true, is the caste system. The caste system that was passed down through some of the later uh, Vedic texts, uh, which claims that certain people are more worthy than others based on their birth, something that is, is not true. As for reason, the second improper source of knowledge, uh, it's not entirely clear what the Buddha's after here, but I think we can get an idea. Uh, elsewhere in several texts, or a couple of texts, a couple of suttas, the Buddha talks about people expressing their own ideas based upon reason or reasoned contemplation. And here I think the idea that the Buddha is getting after is we have what are what we might term today armchair theorists. That is, people who you know, perhaps sitting in their armchair in the comfort of their home, sort of spin out theories and ideas based upon their own sort of idea of what's rational or reasonable. Uh, and that, again, does not necessarily lead you to true conclusions. Now, to be clear, the Buddha had nothing against reasoned arguments generally. In fact, uh, the Buddha did, when arguing with, uh, with other people at the time in the early suttas, he did point out when his opponents were contradicting themselves and used those contradictions as evidence that the opponents he was arguing against uh, were incorrect. So again, it's not that the, the Buddha was against logic and reason, it's simply that logic and reason in order to uh, lead us to true conclusions has to be based on true premises. And oftentimes, will accept 
something as a premise that seems to us reasonable and true, but that is, in fact, false. Uh, in early years, uh, centuries ago, a perfect example of this would be the premise that the Earth seems to be flat and unmoving. Uh, this seems incontrovertible to us. I mean, you look around, you, you don't see the Earth as being a sphere, you don't see the Earth as hurtling through space at thousands of miles an hour, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but nevertheless, if we use that premise in an argument, we're going to be led to false conclusions. That's a, an example where something that seems reasonable and, and rational and logical is, in fact, not true. And this is why, in fact, the Buddha rejected the claim that the, his own dharma was simply a working out of reason or logical thought. Indeed, uh, having attained enlightenment, the Buddha uh, said, this dharma I have discovered is deep, hard to see, hard to understand, peaceful, sublime, beyond the scope of logic, subtle, and comprehensible to the astute. But what does he mean by being beyond the scope of logic? Well, he doesn't, again, it does not mean that the Dharma is illogical or irrational. Uh, as I've already said, the Buddha is very clearly uh, I interested in reasoned, logical argument. He, he, he engages in such argument with other people. It's rather that the Dharma, the Buddhist Dharma, is not merely derived from reason. It's not sort of an armchair theory that the Buddha discovered sort of by sitting down somewhere for a while and thinking it out. But then how did the Buddha discover the Dharma? That is, what is the Buddha's positive, positive account of the achievement of knowledge? We've already, we're, what we've been discussing up until now are bad sources of knowledge, improper sources of knowledge. What are proper sources of knowledge? Well, the Buddha goes on to describe those in this discussion to the Kalamas, or at least to give us some insight into where he's going. What does the Buddha say? The Buddha says, once again, when you know for yourselves these things are skillful, blameless, praised by sensible people, and when you undertake them, they lead to welfare and happiness, then you should acquire them and keep them. That is to say, the knowledge is gained by seeing something for yourself, that when you see it for yourself that it's good, when you undertake it and discover that it leads to good ends, then you should, you should undertake it. This leads, this kind of approach to knowledge leads a Jayatilic to consider the Buddha as an empiricist. Empiricism is a Western philosophical tradition that holds that our knowledge all derives from experience, not from some other source such as reason or tradition. So all that we know derives from our sense data, that is to say all the information we can get through our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body, as well as what we can derive from that sense data through uh, reason or logic or trying to understand how these things fit together. However, Jayatilik notes that the Buddha's idea or the Buddha's approach to empiricism is different from that you find in Europe in one particular way. That is that the Buddha allows for more sources of experiential knowledge than we find in Europe. That is, the Buddha adds to these uh, normal five senses other more, we might say, speculative kinds of uh, senses, sense data, uh, supernatural kinds of understanding that the Buddha claimed to have access to. These sorts, we might call them extrasensory percept perceptual abilities, stem from deep uh, meditative absorption. Uh, for example, the Buddha's claimed ability to witness his own past lives, his claimed ability to witness the action of karma with himself and with other people, his claimed ability to have, again, extrasensory perception of certain kinds of events, is something that stems from these kinds, at least in his telling, stems from uh, deep uh, meditative perception. Now, by the light of current understanding, these 
uh, uh, sources of extrasensory perception may be considered somewhat questionable, but nevertheless, we have to understand that by the lights of early Buddhism, they were considered valid knowledge. And we may ask ourselves how veridical they really are, or are they more akin to sort of dream states of a kind? Nevertheless, in early Buddhism, the claim is that proficiency in the what's called the fourth jhana, which is the fourth state of deep meditative absorption, got into after a long, long training, that it's proficiency in this fourth jhana that leads the mind to be able to undertake this kind of extrasensory perceptual ability. Although it does appear that not everyone in the early tradition had access to such abilities. In particular, it appears that Sariputta, who was the Buddha's right-hand disciple and uh, number one, the, the most important in wisdom, appears perhaps not to have had them himself, or at least not to have been interested in them. That's at least what comes down to us in a, in a, in a couple of short sentences in a poem that Sariputta is reputed to have composed. And I have a, a video on Sariputta, I'll leave a link to that as well down in the notes. In any event, the upshot here is that the Buddha seems to have put forward a, ver a version of what we might term an empiricist epistemology, where our knowledge of things, our knowledge of the world, our knowledge of the way things are, of the Dharma, does not stem from tradition or uh, from reason, but rather from experience our having to experience it ourselves in order to know it. Merely hearing about something from someone else, merely reasoning about it ourselves, or merely having faith in it is not sufficient for knowledge. And if you're interested in that relation between faith and knowing in early Buddhism, I have a, another video on that topic and I'll leave a link to it up here on the screen if you haven't seen it or would like to see it again. If you're getting something out of these videos of mine, consider taking a look at my Patreon page, which is linked here on the screen or down below in the notes, and see if you want to help support the channel and the work that I'm doing here. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.